recording. Okay, here we are with the man, the myth, the legend, ladies and gentlemen, Erwin Yablons, the man responsible for Halloween. And this is his new book, The Man Who Created Halloween, Erwin Yablons. Some text. How a bit of desperation and inspiration gave birth to the movie that changed Hollywood. I love it. I love it. I like that. I like that. So now people, hardcore fans, obviously know the story. But tell me, what do you think, be, before we go back, what do you make of all this? I mean, this is 40 years it's later. I mean, you know, think of that time when you just had this idea. You know? I, was, I was saying to people recently, if you'd have told me 40 years ago, when I released this movie with my own little company, after all the major studios turned it down, yeah, that I'd be sitting here doing this, and yeah. with thousands of people watching the 11th iteration of the movie, bigger than ever, it would have been too much to, to possibly fathom. I Absolutely. I couldn't have imagined something like that. Yeah. But it's just a great example of Never believing your little idea might not be good enough. That's right. That's right. And your original idea was the babysitter murder. No, no, that's the misconception. Okay. The idea was simultaneous. I had just done. A, uh, I had just released Salt on Precinct 13. Also directed a, by John Carpenter. I had a fledgling company called Compass, and the movie did not do well in the United States. So I took it to, to Europe to sell some foreign rights and sold a few. And I was coming home. I was very tired. I was in. Uh, London Hotel when I got a phone call from a man named Michael Myers. May I come up and see you? Yes, he wanted to buy the English rights. He said, not only do I like your movie, but I'm going to enter it in the London Film Festival, which he did. Very cool. He won first prize. Wow, Long story great. short, I had to find a way to make another movie with this young John Carpenter yeah. before the studios might find him. On a flight back from Italy, from Milan one night, I was thinking hard about what I could do to make over the story and I said I think we'll do a horror film because they're easy to make and they have a built-in audience and we'll do it on one night because I can control the budget and then serendipity a light bulb yeah Halloween popped into my mind the scariest right. night of the year and I remember saying to myself well I'm sure someone's done it before or it's certainly been used I got off the plane ran home called John right from my and then I threw my bags down at yeah. night. He, he said, that's so exciting. I said, well, I want to do a movie called Halloween. I want to make it about babysitters being terrorized. And why? Because it's a common denominator. That's there right. Either a baby, he had a babysitter. Now, was John immediately on board, or was he a little He got sorta... it on the phone call. He got it right away. But I think John in those days would have made a movie about this table if I asked him to. <laughs> <laughs> but he also knew that Assault on Precinct 13 had just done really well overseas. That's right. So he had that bit of confidence now. That's right. But moreover, he understood the concept because what I told him right. was, I want this to be theater of the mind because I'm the last of the radio generation. Love it. Love it. I don't want the people to see as much as they think they see. It's the best. Think of Hitchcock, that was his style, and think yep. of even the exorcism. Yep. I said, what's scarier than walking up a staircase and not knowing what's at the other end? It's the it unknown. It's the anticipation that's right. That's right. Not the reality. I want no blood. I want no gore. I remember specifically saying, use the Panavision because we can take the audience to the left, draw their attention and say boo on the right. right. I almost want it methodic, mechanical, so that every 10 minutes they're conditioned to be ready for scare. Right. John got the concept, we met the next day over a tuna fish sandwich. That's great. And uh, history started. Was the tuna fish sandwich good? Very good. Okay. All right. Very good. <laughs> Was it the hamburger hamlet? But we had a tuna fish sandwich. Is it still there? Yes. Okay. John, John... This was one of those interesting situations where everything lined up. Everything from the concept to the, to the raising the money to the making of the movie to the distribution, which I handled. Right. Everything about it meshed seamlessly. Nothing went wrong. Everything was perfect. Right. On a relatively minuscule, non existent budget. Yeah. Yeah, it's amazing. I mean, 300,000 and change. Well, I used another 25,000 because I wanted to use Donald Pleasant. That's right. I had seen him in Wolf Penny playing a maniacal patriarch of a bunch of brigands. If you ever get a chance to watch that movie, you'll right. see what I mean. Because John wanted to use uh, 
Christopher Lee. He wanted his Peter Cushing. Oh, Peter Cushing. They both turned it down, which I was delighted with because I, I told John those that would make it another Hammer movie, you know. Right, right. Peter could uh, uh, rather. Uh, Donald Pleasant. Donald Pleasant would give the picture, in my opinion, gravitas plus a unique yeah. kind of novelty. Yeah. I didn't think he'd take the job. Yeah. But as it turned out, in England, his daughter had seen the Sultan Precinct 13 and loved the music. Right. That's why he did it. That's why he did it. It's amazing. So I had to find another 25000 who Mustafa Khan put up the money. Yeah, well, I'm sure once he realized it was Donald Pleasance on board, he thought, no problem, right? Yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. But at, at Pleasance, of course, gave the picture. I think Pleasance was the catalyst for the movie. Well, he grounded it and gave it a sense of authenticity. That's what I wanted. Exactly. Yeah, it's always and he, good. And I'll tell you something else about horror movies, and it's a great lesson. Yeah. I've always believed this. You don't ever play horror movies tongue in cheek unless they're comedies. Right. Treat it as seriously as you can. Never wink at it. That's because right. Because if you wink, you lose the audience. You lose, That's right. You, you lose their belief. And Pleasance played it like he was playing Shakespeare. Yes, he did. He did. And and even what John Carpenter wrote, all the all the lines for him. You know, you can write the best lines in the world, but if you don't have an actor that's going to execute those lines in Some such, such a profound way, yes, it's far it's away. The subtleties, look. yeah. Plus, it's a, a consummate actor. You could see he believed that he once he signed on, he gave this picture everything he had. He never yeah. looked down on it. That's right. That's right. And this was his band of kids who never done anything. That's right. He was 25 years older than everybody on the movie. Yeah, yeah. It's amazing. It's amazing to think. And now, here you are 40 years later, and certainly you've done other things in your life, but... Well, this is the seminal thing. This is what defines me, actually. I made a lot of movies. There, there they are, some of them. Yeah, uh, no, but, for sure. But it always come back. But now that we've come to... The, and then, of course, there was a wonderful partnership between myself and Mustafa Akkad, and now his son. My son was in the movie. So, yeah. Uh, it gives me a great, a great feeling of satisfaction to know that I have now left behind an iconic piece of American culture. You have. You have. I mean, it is absolutely considered one of the greatest for a very specific reason. Like you just said, the theater of the mind, it's timeless because we're all afraid of the unknown. It's that psychological aspect that a, frightens us it all. It is a visceral, a visceral thing that, that we tapped into yep. that will we'll work again and again and yep. again. And Certainly. you know what? It, it's aged quite well. It, it, it's amazing. Every time I see it, I think, well, but they love it. Audience. Well, you always notice things that you wish you could have done a bit differently or, or something little, like actually. that. But <laughs> Very little. This movie's almost perfect. Listen here, purity. Dave. In its purity. Oh, it is. It is. That I agree with. John that Carpenter I agree with. was on his game. Yep. He was fighting for a career. And he had the audacity to ask me, by the way, I want my name above the title. <laughs> I said, can you do it for $300,000? He said, yes. I said, you can have anything you want. It's, it's amazing. And no doubt we cannot understate the music that well, Carpenter Well, that's gave. another story. I mean, that's... When, when I saw the picture in its first form without music, yeah. it was effective, but it wasn't what it yeah. became with the music. When yeah. I saw it again with the music, the music is, I dare say, it is one of the most identifiable and effective and well-known musical scores in film history. And that's saying something. I absolutely agree with you. And that's not because I'm a Halloween fan. It's looking at it objectively and looking at the... Because it's not just... Like, the music in and of itself is a character in the film. And without that music, you know, the movie... You, you know, know it, it loses and it, something. And it has to do with what... I have my theory. I used to make a lot of low-budget movies and yeah. I, used to, I used to tell people I have... I have my theory is I operate on the instant parody. Right. Theory. What does that mean? It means that there's no corollary between what a movie costs to make and what it will make right. and how it will affect the audience. It's right. the only industry I know where the cost of manufacture has nothing to do with the, with, with the result. That's right. Uh, somebody once said to me, well, I just saw that movie. It was $40 million a day. $40 yeah. million dollars to make. Yeah. I said, worth $40 million? Said, You're asking the wrong question question should be is it worth five dollars yes exactly exactly yeah that's the only thing is it worth the price of admission that's the only thing the audience that's really right does. that's right so so halloween uh that music hey you've got Maurice Shaw with Florence of Arabia you've got the music Jaws with the wind <laughs> and then you've got halloween which yeah. is just as well known by yeah, the way the ringtones I know we have the ringtones yeah they are 
so many people buy that ringtone. Well, I heard that Carpenter's ringtone is the Halloween theme. I don't know if there's it truth is. to that. Yeah, it is. Yeah. My wife has yeah. that. <laughs> That's great. You can have wife, it. Yeah, I, 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 I just might. Oh, it's fantastic. Might. No, it is. It's I good don't stuff. have it because we never know which photo it would be. <laughs> It's <laughs> a wonderful ringtone. It is. It is. No, it is. Well, listen, Erwin, uh, I appreciate your time. My I pleasure. really do. Um, and your book again. Can you hold up your book? Yes. This is the book. This is awesome. The Man Who Created Halloween. How a bit of desperation and inspiration gave birth to the uh, to the movie that changed Hollywood. You might enjoy. I'm definitely going you to might pick enjoy it up. the blurb uh, on the back. Oh, yes. Let me see if I can get that there. Oh, you can read it. I can read it. Let me see here. Okay. Right there. You dumb bitch. You deserve to die. That was the cry from somewhere in the darkness. Jamie Lee Curtis had once again dropped the knife, and the audience responded in horror and disbelief. It was December 1978. I was sitting in the last row of the Rivoli Theater in New York. Sorry? Rivoli. Rivoli Theater in New York City. The film was reaching its climactic moments and a thousand or so people were shrieking at the screen as Michael Myers yet again rose from the floor to resume his murderous pursuit of Laurie Strode. The images on the screen, relentlessly accompanied by the pounding musical score, were driving the crowd into a frenzy. Never in my experience had I witnessed this kind of visceral reaction to a movie. They shouted at the, act- they shouted at the actors, screamed warnings, and laughed crazily to relieve the tension. It was as if the fourth wall had been breached and the viewers were indeed part of the action. They, too, were there, struggling to survive the the maniac. There could be no doubt Halloween was a smash. You read that very well. (laughs) It's my job. (laughs) Good good prose. Yeah. All right, that's the book. I'm going to get Erwin to uh, sign it now. Folks, thanks for tuning in.